Thank you, and hi everyone. I'm Lynn Clark, and I make code cartoons. And I also work at Mozilla. I'm in the emerging technologies group there. So that's things like the Rust programming language, and Servo, which is a new super fast rent a browser engine, and WebAssembly, which is what I'm going to be talking about today. Since this is JSConf, I'm guessing that most of you are JavaScript developers. And so you know that in JavaScript circles today, there's a lot of hype about WebAssembly. People are talking about how blazingly fast it is and how it's going to completely change the way that we do web development. But a lot of these conversations don't go into details about exactly what it is about WebAssembly that makes it fast. And I know when I hear this kind of rhetoric, but I don't hear the details to back it up, the inner skeptic in me comes out. So in this talk, I don't just want to tell you about how fast WebAssembly is going to be, but I want to help you understand what it is about WebAssembly that makes it fast and in what circumstances it's fast. But first, what is WebAssembly? WebAssembly is a way to run programming languages other than JavaScript in your web pages. So in the past, when you wanted to run code on a web page, you had to use JavaScript. If you wanted to change the DOM in response to an event or run a calculation, you were using JavaScript. But with WebAssembly, it will be possible to do these things with other languages besides JavaScript. So when people say that WebAssembly is fast, what they're comparing it to is JavaScript. That's the apples to apples comparison. Now, I don't want to imply that it's an either or decision, that you're either going to be using WebAssembly or you're going to be using JavaScript. In fact, we think that people are probably going to be using these two hand in hand in their applications. But it is useful to compare the two so that you understand what this improved performance of code running on the web could mean. In order to understand this, let's look at a little bit of performance history of code running on the web. JavaScript was created in 1995, and it wasn't designed to be fast. There are a number of features in JavaScript that make it hard to make it fast, and you heard a little bit about that this morning. There are things like dynamic types, where you have a variable that could be a string or an integer, and you don't know. Even at runtime, that variable could change. But these features also make it easy for developers to get up and running with JavaScript really quickly. So JavaScript developers accepted this trade-off. They accepted that their code was going to run a little bit slower because of this ease of use. And for the first decade of JavaScript, that was true, that JavaScript was pretty slow. And then the browsers started getting more competitive. In about 2008, a period started called the Performance Wars, where the browser vendors started improving their JS engines to make things much faster. And the technique that they used was introducing JIT compilers to the JavaScript engine. And I'll explain a little bit more about that later. But for now, let's look at the impact that these JIT compilers had. With the introduction of the JITs, you see an inflection point in the performance of JavaScript. All of a sudden, JavaScript code was running about 10 times faster than it had previously. And these imp performance improvements continued over the next decade. With this improved performance, you start seeing JavaScript being used for things that you never would have expected, so things like Node and Electron. And these new applications are possible because of this improvement in performance. It's because of this inflection point 10 years ago that we have the applications that we do today. That's why it's interesting that we may be approaching another one of these inflection points in the speed of code running on the web with WebAssembly. And this is where I need to start backing up what I'm saying with some details. To do this, I need to explain a little bit about where JavaScript spends its time today. Here's a diagram of where the JS engine spends its time for a hypothetical app. Now, this isn't showing an average. For any particular app, it's going to be quite different. But we can use this to build up a mental model. And you may have seen diagrams like this one before and be confused why there are fewer categories in this one. I've condensed the number of categories just so it's easier to reason and talk about it. So these categories are parsing, compiling and optimizing, re-optimizing, executing the code, and garbage collection. Now let's look at what this diagram would look like for WebAssembly. You'll notice that some of the bars are shorter and some are missing. And in this talk, I want to explain what WebAssembly changes, how it makes the amount of time that the engine spends in these tasks 
shorter or gets rid of them altogether. But first, let's look at where JS engines would be if the, we hadn't introduced the JIT. In the early days of JavaScript, this diagram would have looked more like this. There was parsing, running the code, and garbage collection. What made the execution bar shorter, what made that run faster, was the introduction of the JIT and this little bit of overhead that it added, the compiling and optimizing. Now with WebAssembly, we want to make these bars even shorter. And in order to see how we can do that, we're going to need to dive into the work that the JIT does. So I'm going to go through a quick crash course in just-in-time compilers. And this is a general overview. The different engines have different architectures. And those architectures have changed over time. But most of this applies to most of them right now. This may be review for some of you, but it'll be quick. I just want to make sure that we're all up to speed on this. When you're developing, you have a goal and a problem. Your goal is that you want to tell the computer what to do. The problem is that you speak a human language, and the machine speaks a machine language. Even if you don't think of JavaScript as a human language, it really is. Because it's been designed for human cognition, not for machine cognition. I think of this like the movie Arrival we have aliens and humans trying to communicate with one another. It's not as easy as translating word for word from one language to the other, because the two groups actually have different ways of seeing the world. And that's true of humans and machines, too. I'll explain more about the differences in the way we think later. But let's look at the process of translating. In programming, there are generally two ways of translating. You can either use an interpreter or a compiler. With an interpreter, the translation happens pretty much on the fly, line by line. A compiler, on the other hand, doesn't translate on the fly. It takes time ahead of time to create that translation and then hand it off. There are pros and cons to each, way, each of these ways of handling this translation. So for an interpreter, some of the pros are that it's quick to get up and running. You get that immediate feedback loop. So an interpreter seems like a natural fit for something like JavaScript, where you want the developer to see their progress really quickly. And that's why, in the beginning, browsers used JavaScript interpreters. But the trade-off is that when you're doing something like a loop, where you have to run the same code over and over again, you're doing that translation over and over again. The compiler has opposite trade-offs. It takes a little bit more time to start up, because it has to go through that compilation step ahead of time. But then you don't incur that translation cost in loops where you're running the code over and over again. And another difference is that interpreters are running during the execution of the code. So they can't take too much time to actually think about how the machine thinks and what the optimal way to communicate with the machine is. But since compilers are working ahead of time, they can take that little bit of extra time and think about how to best communicate with the machine. And you'll hear that referred to as optimization. To get the best of both worlds, browsers started mixing compilers in. They added a new part of the JavaScript engine called a monitor or a profiler. The monitor watches the code as it runs. And it keeps track of things, like how often a function is being executed. At first, the monitor just runs everything through the interpreter. And if the same function is run a few times, that function is called warm. As a function warms up, it gets sent off to the baseline compiler to create a compiled version of it. So the baseline compiler is going to start making this compiled version, but it's going to do it in chunks. Each operation in the function is going to be compiled to one or more stubs. So for example, the plus equal sign would be an operation. The compiler would create a stub for that. And the stub would be specific to whatever types were being used on other, either side of that operator. So if the sum and the array element here were integers, it would compile to integer addition. If the monitor hits that operation again with the same variable type, so with integers again, then it just pulls out the stub it has and uses that. And if it, has different, if it runs into this operation with different variable types, it will create another stub and store that one as well. As the code runs, more baseline stubs for more operations will be filled in. And this will save on translation time and help speed things up. But like I mentioned, there's more that a compiler can do. 
It can take some time thinking about how the machine thinks and how to best communicate with the machine. It can take time to make those optimizations. Now, the baseline compiler will make some optimizations, but it doesn't want to take up too much time because the code is executing at the same time. But if the code is really hot, if it's being run a whole bunch, then it can be worthwhile to actually go through and take the time to make that optimization. So when a part of the code is very hot, the monitor will send it to the optimizing compiler. And this will create another, even faster version of that function. In order to make the faster version of the function, the optimizing compiler has to make some assumptions. For example, if it can assume that all of the objects that are created by a particular constructor have the same shape, so that is the object has the same property names and they've been added in the same order, then it can cut some corners based on that. So the optimizing compiler uses the information that the monitor has been gathering to make these judgments. And if something has been true for all previous passes through the code, then it assumes it's going to continue to be true. But of course, with JavaScript, there are never any guarantees. You could have 99 objects that all have the same shape, but then the 100th object has a different property or a property has been deleted on it. So the compiled code needs to check before it runs to see whether the assumptions are valid. And if they are, then the compiled code runs. But if not, the JIT assumes that it made the wrong assumptions and trashes the optimized code. At this point, the execution goes back to the interpreter or to the baseline compiled version. And this process is called deoptimization or bailing out. Usually, optimizing compilers will save you time. They will actually make the code run faster. But if you have code that keeps hitting, you know, gets optimized and then gets bailed out on and then gets optimized again, if you get into these cycles, it can actually take more time than it would have just running through the baseline compiled version of the code. So a lot of JITs will keep track of how many times they've tried to optimize a function. And if it just keeps not working out, then they'll mark it as don't even try optimizing this again. So that is the JIT in a nutshell. Code starts off running in an interpreter, and the monitor collects information about it. And then it will send code off to be compiled, depending on how often that code, part of the code is being run. Now that we understand more about the work that the JavaScript engine is doing, let's look at ways to maybe make this execution go a little faster. One way would be to get rid of some of the overhead. So we can move some of this ahead of time. But in order to do that, we would need to get rid of the dynamic types. If we're going to be optimizing ahead of time, we need the types to be explicit in the code, because we aren't going to be monitoring it at runtime and seeing what types are flowing through it. So these dynamic types that can change at runtime are a problem. But I already suggested that that was part of what made JavaScript successful. The dynamic types help developers get up and running quickly. Why would we want to change something that made JavaScript successful? I want to be clear here that we don't have to change anything in JavaScript to take advantage of the benefits of WebAssembly. But there is a change that's already happening, which we can take advantage of. And that is the move towards modularity. Over the past few years, both with NPM and with the ES2015 module spec, JavaScript has become a much more modularized ecosystem. And the nice thing about modules is that they provide boundaries. You don't really need to know about the inner details of a module that you're depending on. So these modules, they could be compiled ahead of time using a language that doesn't have these flexible types that JavaScript does. And it wouldn't affect how you code. Take, for example, React, which has a lot of different consumers. The React core team has already been working on making their reconciliation algorithm faster. An option for them would be to rewrite that rec rec the new reconciliation algorithm in a language that has types, something like C, and then compile it ahead of time. But as long as they keep the API the same, consumers of React actually wouldn't notice this. When they update the code, the only thing they would notice is any performance improvements. So this is what WebAssembly does. It makes it possible for library authors and application developers to code in languages that are more consistently performant but then to have that code run on the web just like JavaScript does, and to integrate with existing JavaScript. 
This means that you'll be able to benefit from WebAssembly without having to understand it or why it's fast. But I always find it more rewarding when I do understand that stuff. So I'm going to go ahead and walk you through how WebAssembly works. In order to do that, I'm going to have to go through another little crash course, this time in assembly and compilers. I talked about how communicating with the machine is like communicating with an alien. I want to take a look now at how that alien brain works, how the communication that's coming into it gets parsed and understood. There's a part of this alien brain that's dedicated to the thinking, like adding and subtracting and logic. And there's also a part of the brain near that, which is the short-term memory. And those parts are pretty close together in the same part of the brain. And then there's some longer-term memory. So this is, these different parts have different names. So the part that does the thinking is the arithmetic and logic unit, the ALU. The short-term memory, those are called registers. And that's all encapsulated in the central processing unit, or the CPU. And then the longer-term memory, that's random access memory, or RAM. Each little part of the short-term memory has a name. And this makes it easier for the brain to understand what it should be working on at any given time. The sentences in machine communication are called instructions. When one of these instructions comes into the brain, it gets split up into parts that mean different things. So the way that this instruction is going to be split up is going to be very specific to the wiring of this particular brain. For example, this brain might always take the fourth through the tenth bit and pipe that into the ALU. And then based on where there are ones and zeros, the ALU will figure out what exactly it's supposed to do for this instruction. So then the brain would take the next two chunks to figure out what it needs to do that, that operation on. And these would be the addresses of registers. You'll see that I've been adding annotations above the machine code here. That makes it easier for us as humans to understand what's going on with this machine code. And that's actually what assembly is. It's called symbolic machine code. It's a way of human beings being able to read and understand machine code. You can see here that there's a one-to-one -one relationship between the assembly and the machine code for this machine. Something you might have figured out from that is that you actually have a different kind of assembly for each kind of wiring you have for a machine. Anytime that you have a different architecture inside of a machine, anytime there's a different kind of brain in the machine, there's a good chance that it will have its own assembly. So we're not talking about the target of this translation just being one thing, just being one kind of machine code. It's many different kinds of machine code. Just as we speak different languages as humans, Machines speak different languages. So if we're talking human to alien translation, you may be going from English or Russian or Mandarin to alien language A or to alien language B. In programming terms, this is like going from C or C++ or Rust to x86 or to ARM. And if you want to be able to go from any one of these high-level programming languages down to any one of these assembly languages, you're going to need to create a whole bunch of different translators. That would be pretty inefficient. So what most compilers do is they put at least one layer between. The compiler will take the high-level programming language and translate it down to something that's not quite as high-level, but is not as low-level as machine code. And this is called an intermediate representation. So the compiler will take any one of the higher-level programming languages and go down to the single intermediate representation, and then go from the single intermediate representation to any one of the assembly languages. The thing that goes from the higher level programming language to the intermediate representation is called a front end. And the thing that goes from the intermediate representation down to the assembly is called a back end. So now, where does WebAssembly fit in this picture? Well, you might think that it's one of these target assembly languages, which is kind of true, except that each one of those languages corresponded to a particular architecture. And when you're delivering code across the web, you don't actually know what architecture you're going to be running on. So WebAssembly is a little bit different from normal assembly. It's a machine language for a conceptual machine, not an actual physical machine. Once the browser downloads the WebAssembly, it can make the short hop between the WebAssembly code and the actual assembly code for that particular architecture. 
Let's walk through the tools that a developer of a library like React would use to make their code WebAssembly. The compiler toolchain that's had a lot of work go into it for WebAssembly is called LLVM. And there are a number of different front ends and back ends for LLVM. So if we wanted to go from C to WebAssembly, we might use Clang as our front end. And that would take us down from C to the intermediate representation. And then once it's, the code is in the intermediate representation, LLVM can actually do some optimizations on top of that for us, because it understands it at that point. And then we want to go from the intermediate representation down to WebAssembly. There's a back end that's currently in progress for LLVM that will go all the way to WebAssembly. But you might not want to use it until it's fully uh, finished. And in that case, there's another tool called Inscriptum, which does have a fully finished back end, WebAssembly back end. It uses a fork of LLVM under the hood. Even after the LLVM backend is done, you still might want to use Inscriptin to compile your code. Um, it can be used to pack in some interesting and uh, useful libraries, things like a file system that works on top of IndexedDB. But regardless of whether you're using LLVM to get there or Inscriptin to get there, the end result is a file that ends in .wasm for WebAssembly. This is the WebAssembly module, and it can be loaded in JavaScript. Right now, the way that you load it in JavaScript is a little bit complicated, and we're working on making that easier. Webpack uh, has plans to work on it, and other module loaders are also working on it. Plus, once the browsers have the uh, built-in module support, WebAssembly can use that too. So it should be as easy as loading a JavaScript module. When I say that, though, I should add a caveat. Loading a WebAssembly module should be as easy as loading a, a JavaScript one. But working with it is going to be a little bit different. Let's say you're calling a WebAssembly function from JavaScript, and this is the, web, uh, this is the JavaScript function, and this is the WebAssembly function. Functions in WebAssembly can only take WebAssembly types as parameters. And at the moment, that's numbers. So integers, floats, that's what you're working with. So that's different from regular JavaScript modules. And the same restriction applies to return values as well. But what if you want to be able to return a string? You can't do it. For any data types that are more complex, you need to put them in the WebAssembly module's memory. So this memory is an array buffer. It's just a JavaScript object that simulates a heap. The integers that get passed back and forth can be used kind of like pointers into this heap. So the C code can use that to write to the memory as if it were an address. And then the JavaScript can use that number to figure out the array index that it needs to pull the value from. It's likely that anybody who's developing a WebAssembly module for developers is going to create a wrapper around it so that you don't actually need to know about that. But I think it helps to understand the performance characteristics, understanding how the memory works. What I want to do now is go back to this diagram and look at what it is about WebAssembly that can make things run faster. So first off, this isn't actually shown in the diagram, but it can take less time to download WebAssembly than it does JavaScript, because it's more compact. It was designed specifically to be compact. And it can also be translated into a binary form. Even though gzip JavaScript is pretty small, if you have the equivalent code in WebAssembly, it's likely that it'll be smaller. Parsing takes less time than JavaScript, too. JavaScript needs to be parsed from the source into an abstract syntax tree, and then it's usually converted into a, an intermediate representation called bytecode that's specific to the JavaScript engine that's running that code. WebAssembly is already a bytecode. It just needs to be decoded from that binary version, and decoding is faster than parsing. Compiling takes less time, because a lot of it has been done ahead of time, before the file was even put up to the server. Plus, the compiler doesn't have to compile those multiple baseline stubs that it was doing before for the dynamic types. And you don't get into the optimize and de-optimize cycles that you did with the JIT. Running your code is fast, because many of the optimizations that JIT makes, the JIT makes to JavaScript just aren't necessary with WebAssembly. Plus, WebAssembly itself provides many instructions that are just faster. 
Human programmers don't actually need to program WebAssembly directly. So that means that as designers could create something that's closer to how machines think. So depending on what kind of code your, your code is doing, uh, these instructions can run anywhere from 10% to 800% faster. And as for garbage collection, at least for now, the languages that are supported use manual memory management. And this is likely to change. I'll explain more about that later. But for now, you don't need to worry about garbage collection. So what is the status of WebAssembly right now? In late February, the browser vendors announced that WebAssembly was ready to ship on by default in browsers. And we started shipping it on by default in Firefox the next week. And then Chrome did the same the week after that. And it's currently in preview versions of Edge and Safari. With this, developers can start shipping WebAssembly code. For earlier versions of browsers that don't support WebAssembly, you can ship down an ASM.js version. ASM.js was the precursor to WebAssembly, but it's fully JS. What's in browsers is the MVP, the minimum viable product. The MVP doesn't contain all of the features that the community group wants, but with it, WebAssembly is reasonably fast and usable. However, it should get even faster in the future through a combination of fixes in the engines and new features in the spec. For example, a fix that needs to happen in Firefox specifically is that currently calling a WebAssembly function in JS code is slower than it needs to be. And that's because it has to do something called trampolining. So instead of the JIT knowing how to deal directly with WebAssembly code, it has to go through a setup function. And that transfers the control from JavaScript to WebAssembly. This is a lot slower than it would be if the JIT knew how to handle this function itself. Now, slower is relative. We're only talking nanoseconds here. But if you have lots of back and forth communication between WebAssembly and JavaScript, you can notice that. So that's the kind of fix that you can expect in the engine. As for the spec, there are a number of features that are coming soon. One that's expected reasonably soon is threading. One way to speed up the code is to make it possible for different parts of the code to run at the same time in parallel. But this can sometimes backfire since the overhead of communication between threads can take up more time than it would have to just run that all sequentially. But if you share memory between the threads, it reduces this overhead. To do this, WebAssembly will use the new shared array buffer that's being uh, shipped in browsers shortly. Once that's in place in browsers, the community group can start specifying how WebAssembly will use it. Another feature that needs to be standardized is direct DOM access. Currently, there's no way to interact with the DOM. And that means that you can't do something like element.innerHTML uh, element to update the node from WebAssembly. Instead, you have to go through JS to set that value. The community group is currently working on adding DOM support, though. And one last feature that has a lot of folks excited is integration with the browser's garbage collection. So today, you can chip down your own garbage collector with your code if you want to. But that's kind of slow for a few reasons. And it's also hard to integrate with the browser's built-in GC. But the community group is working on making it possible for WebAssembly code to be uh, used with just the built-in GC, which is a highly optimized one that the browsers have been working on. So it'll run fast, and you'll have that integration. Unfortunately, that's all I have time to talk about today. So I'm going to have to wrap it up. But before I do, I want to give a thank you. Uh, I had fantastic technical review on this from Luke Wagner. He is the person who came up with the way to add, ch add types in ASM.js. And he also did a lot of the work to push WebAssembly forward. Unfortunately, he's here today. So the two of us will be doing a Q&A about WebAssembly in the Mozilla space at lunch. So come, feel free to come and ask us questions. Or you can ask on Twitter, or we'll both be at the party tonight. So thank you to him, and thank you all for listening.